Good morning, all. Welcome to this meeting of the Audit and Risk Committee. All right, we can start, please, with thank you, the Council Prayer. Almighty God, as members of the Rangitike District Council, we give thanks for all the good things of our district and the advantages we enjoy. We pray that you will give us wisdom and guidance as we conduct the affairs of this meeting. We pray for all the communities and the district we represent. Help us to be fair and honest in our discussions and help us to work together in unity for the welfare of all your people. Amen. Yes. How are you? Good, thank you. All right. Um, apologies. We should just note Angus, please, potentially for lateness, one would imagine. There's no public forum. We uh, now would just check on conflicts of interest, please, with items on the agenda. Anything? Just checking, Dave's? No, nothing, Nigel? No. Thank you. And he shook his head, so that is no from all of us. Thank you. Confirmation of order of business. No changes. Confirmation of minutes. Happy to move. Seconded. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Uh, before we move on, I have, I do actually have an apology to make based on those minutes. Minor, I hope. Um, but I had, uh, the paper that I have put in on the uh, risks for the rail hub, I had indicated in the minutes that I was going to circulate that prior to coming to this meeting to the CEO and the chair, and I overlooked that step. So my apologies, Mr. Mayor, sorry, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. CEO. Accepted. <laughs> All right. Um, Follow-up items from previous. So just a reminder that um, Ash said, has sent out a replacement for that just this morning. So if you use the replacement, you should have a copy of this. Thank you. Do you do you want something formal to acknowledge that that's happened? Because just note in the minutes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So we note. The majority of items are closed. Um, Dave, you that first item still in progress. Yeah. Timing's noted. All good. Thank you. And GS is in progress as well. Uh, and we still have to do that particular update. So now I've, can I just check that item, please? So it's, I was wondering, if, is that a general item that we had talked about or was it specific to the rail hub? Um, it was, it was, I brought it up as an interest with you around the rail hub saying somewhere we needed to incorporate it. So I saw it as reasonably specific to the rail hub. Thank you. That's, that was my understanding, in which case that paper is on this agenda. Thank you. So can we please just note the items? This is the last call of action. Correct. Thanks, Ash. Uh, I don't have a chair's report. The... I'm sorry. Thank you. I don't know what I'll do without such good help. 
Could we receive those, the follow up um, actions? Sorry, was that? Thank you, Nigel. Uh, thank you. Again, all in favour? Against? Carried. There is nothing specific in terms of a chair's report. Um, there haven't been any of the Office of the Auditor General uh, reports on audit and risk activities. There's one coming up shortly, and I'll have a further report on that if there's something of interest. So we're moving on to reports for decision, we've got the Rail Hub project, and this was something that I have put together predominantly as a, uh, a paper to stimulate conversation. I have no expectation that it is in any way, shape or form comprehensive. It was intended to look at the top level risks and to at least start on some of the mitigations. I have also spoken to a couple of other chairs of audit and risk externally to seek their thoughts and ideas about the items that should sit on this list. I am, um, I, I have no preciousness about the content of this and am expecting debate and um, modification to the items on this list. Both challenges to what's on there in terms of being a top tier risk, but also the descriptions and anything that might be missed. Uh, also accepting that once this progresses, uh, this is only the first tranche of risk. This is the top tier risk, the actual risk register that will undoubtedly go with the uh, project itself will be far more comprehensive. But these are the sorts of risks that I was anticipating audit and risk and council need to keep a view of in terms of this, the importance of this project. So open for comments, discussion, um, challenges, happy to um, hear any thoughts. Nigel. Thank you, Craig. Um, just a question. So these, this risk, risk matrix or, or first makeup of it, is it based on the delivery of the project rather than operation? So it's, it's based solely on the delivery of this project. Is that correct? Correct. I, uh, there are a couple of items, though, and this is where, particularly when I got into the environmental space, even though the council won't have responsibility for those operations, there will be a spillover effect, particularly at the reputation level. If someone on council land was to do something that was perceived by the public as risky or inappropriate, um, then that would clearly impact council. So even though I constrained my thinking, as, um, as was clearly pointed out, to the council's activity being the rail hub, um, the risks, I think, are not exclusive just to that project. But again, I'm more than happy to be challenged on that. And Peter, we're really happy to take any thoughts and um, inputs from you on those sorts of matters or any of the risks as well. Um, yeah, first of all, we, we've done a lot of um, stuff within the project managership reports for assets. Uh, so I went through this and a whole lot of the risks are part and parcel of that. For instance, not getting the district plan approval um, embedded within that are things like um, um, several of the risks you've noted, noted here in local politics, etc. cetera. Um, so I put down not getting DP approval um, government withdrawing the funding, the land purchase, significant tenant withdrawal, all of those are risks that the project actually doesn't proceed. Um, then there's reputational risk absolutely associated with the project not actually happening. There's also a reputational risk in terms of the project not meeting the expectations of other users. So 
making sure that it is truly a public facility that anybody can use and access is a very significant um, risk to our reputation. And we, and we say that it is public, but we've actually got to make sure all the way through that it can be used. And some of that is, some of that is pricing. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I was looking through this, um, the lists of risks there, and it, it occurred to me one of the things that the mayor's just mentioned is there is a reputational risk to um, to council. But I wonder how many of these risks are directly controllable by us. I, I, I see a number of them are outside our direct control and influence, yet we list them as, as risk to the overall project. And therefore, we we take those risks as a particular as a reputational risk for if that is, if the project should fail in some way. Yet, I wonder if we're directly able to uh, influence some of those those risks. It's just a general thought of some of them. Some of them seem to me to be outside our our scope of influence. And I think. I'd I absolutely accept what you say, Dave. Some of them will be. Um, one of the processes to go through is to try and identify, and this more comes into mitigation, what are the elements that the council does have within its control uh, to change, mitigate or influence. Um, at the same time, I guess there is, you can't close your eyes to those risks if they are significant and could derail a project even if they are outside your control yeah just just further to that i i i think the risks that have been identified uh, certainly agree that they are um that they are real um i guess where my concern is that we should um we accept them as a, as a risk but i think somewhere along the line we need to be quite clear um, about what we can and we cannot influence with regards to um, council's position in this project. I, I, I agree that they are a risk to the overall project, but I, I, my concern is I think that should there be a failure somewhere along the line, um, that failure may be directed as a, as a council failure, which is not directly uh, influenceable by us. And that seems to me to fall back into the question of the reputational risk that as Worship the Mayor mentioned earlier. Absolutely, Dave, and I disagree. I think what the onus then is on us to ensure that the mitigations and the, the actions that take place are things that can be achieved by the council or influenced by the council. So that if someone points to a particular risk if it takes place and says, hold on, you didn't um, do what you could in this area, you can say, well, actually we did. Here's, here are the elements that we could control and that they have been taken, sorry, the action has been taken. So I think the scrutiny comes more at the mitigation level, making sure that we've got those mitigations identified. I think regardless of whether it's something that's under our control or not, the reputational risk we suffer will still be very, very high. Yes. For instance, if, if people have bought properties or decided to build houses on the basis of um, an economic benefit to the district because of this happening, then your reputation does suffer a big dent in much the same way that, for instance, if, if the P8 program was suddenly cancelled and people had bought houses on that basis, um, the reputational risk aim, aimed at, uh, at our community is, is still high. Mm -hmm. We can say, we can sing from the rooftops, it's not our fault, but, but the risk is still there. Absolutely, and, and we can't ignore the risk. Andy, can I come back to the observation you made that the project team has already done a lot of work in terms of risk and the last thing we want to do is duplicate. Well, so 
the project manager and the PMO reports has a series of arrows and colours which illustrate this is where we're at in terms of cost overrun, you know, amber to versus red to green, etc. those sorts of things. Um, the district plan change is also highlighted in that section. So some of the risks are bundled up within those arrows and council are updated and informed as to where it's going. Uh, some of the risks are a little bit more specific, for instance, um, you know, where the government withdrew their funding, et cetera. But Peter may have a, a view around this. All right. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think it is, uh, Andy's correct, it is covered in the PMO reporting, but I think what we're saying is due to the potential damage that can be done, uh, we should have a closer look at it and maybe spend a bit more time on the risk and have more detail on that. But at least, at least, it has been tracked and it has been brought to governance attention, attention on a monthly basis. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's a good start. I think what this says is we can we can definitely have a look and, and pay more attention to it. And I'm I'm thinking that in order to avoid duplication, because there'll be plenty of reporting coming out of the, the project, mm. coming up to governance on and council, and I'm very comfortable that that'll be happening. Um, what I'm thinking is, um, is it worth and and appropriate? And Peter, I look for some guidance here to maybe have a session, Arno with um, possibly you, me and Jess to say what are those things that, that the project actually has covered and what are those other risks that actually sit outside that, that audit and risk and council are particularly interested in, just to ensure that we've got comprehensive picture of those risks. Yeah, I, I like that. I, I, would, I would ask Dave if you want to be involved in that because you have quite a bit of experience in the, in the risk space, and from a financial perspective, I don't know if you want to if you want to be involved in a discussion like that. But, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be open to that. Yeah, I'll yeah, come in if um, it'll be an ongoing thing, and if I'm not adding value, then I'll just go to the first one. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the link for me is that organisational risk register kind of setup that um, that we need to have a better handle on as well. Mm. Uh, we Dave will come into the discussion a bit more, but. But yeah, I, th I think they'll add value, Craig, if we could do that. Yeah. Just, sorry. So Gordon just joined the meeting. Morning. Morning, Angus. <coughs> yeah, Apologies for lateness. Not at all. Thank you, Angus. Nigel. Thanks, Craig. Um, I'm just wondering, is there an opportunity to perhaps put this in front of the Project Advisory Governance Board to ask for any of their input into risks that we may not be identifying here? Um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of, um, a huge amount of experience on that board and uh, with projects such as this, and we may be um, missing something that um, they could add. So I think it's, it would be worth bringing past uh, the members of that board. I think, thank you, Nigel, that's a very sensible suggestion, and I think that would be the logical first step, um, and then we would figure out what's the most sensible way to actually integrate that across the actual project risk um, and, and the risks that are being seen at a governance level. And whether that's a meeting uh, with Jess and Arno, Peter, yourself, I, and Andy, I, look, I've no idea, I'm quite relaxed about how that happens, but I just want to end up with the risks identified clearly and, um, and like I say, avoiding too, too much duplication. Stuff that's already been discussed in the project, we don't need to be spending time on. There are some huge watershed positions coming up with regard to this. For instance, um, if council's responsibility is only one of the railhead, then the risks are associated with that. But if we have in any way an SPV or something that has an interest in, in land, for example, then 
that's a whole series of risks. But if somebody else was to say, well, look, you know, I'll buy the farm, I'll be responsible for all the development, then that's their position. That's a transference of that risk. You know, so um, I think there's a whole lot of watersheds here and the district it starts with the district plan. Um, and then it's then it goes on to well who's actually buying this you know who's um, what's the tenancy agreements those sorts of things. Can I make a suggestion? Uh, I think a logical way forward is we take your report, we have discussion with the with the board, the project board. We get some more input from there. Uh, we then have a discussion with Dave and Jess and, and yourself, and we can include Katrina from a district plan perspective. And then finally, we get to a, a finalized position of what we think the organi organizational risk would be at the time. And then against the project, we have a risk register that is live uh, and dynamic, and we can update and change it. So as things change, and we will always have a view of an RDC organizational position and the risks we are exposed to, and as things change, we'll update that risk register and it will always be the risk register. So I think that will accommodate what Andy is saying. Uh, and it's a piece of paper or a document that we can grab at any time and say, this is our risk and this is where it sits. So if that kind of suits, then I think we can just get that done. I, I think that's a sensible way forward and consistent with what Nigel was suggesting as well. Um, Angus, I realise that you've just joined the meeting, but I've should give you an opportunity. Any questions you have or comments? Still on mute. This is going to be the phrase of... Yeah, of 2022. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, look, I'm, I'm happy with what I've heard so far. Look, I think, I, I mean, my... Thank you, Angus. My view is that, as I said, this, this was really to start to stimulate discussion was not intended to be definitive in any way, shape or form at all. So it will evolve throughout that process. So if we could, and I'm sure Ash has that captured, uh, first to the project board, and then back to uh, the project team. You're thinking, Peter? I am, um, <clears throat> and uh, I would... Uh, encourage you in the committee to um, you have only focus on the rail hub project uh, and you have outlined tier one risks which I think are valid um, there are at least I can think of four what I would call tier one projects that are coming up in our long term plan that are in excess of 10 million so more than this and we don't do anything on those. But when I look at the tier one risks that you've outlined, they all apply. Mm. They, they apply mm. equally to, and I'm thinking the, the, the next one really off cab off the rank is, is our Martin to Bulls Wastewater project. And all those things apply. And I, I wonder if we are, or you as a committee might wish to look at this more broadly from a, mm. you know, what are the tier one projects within the project management office? as defined by whatever yes. uh, value or or risk um, and, and how does the committee are satisfied that those tier one risks are being addressed in each of them which is a you know we do as a PMO report an operational typically an operational view of the, of the risk um, which is different to how you have framed this and I wonder if there's a, a way you might wish to look at that. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that's mm. an entirely appropriate challenge to our, absolutely, um, what, is, what is on our work programme and what should we be uh, looking at. So let's... Um, it, 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 yeah. Sorry, Andy. I, I absolutely agree with Peter. Um, defining the criteria as to what becomes a tier one risk, you know, may be useful. So that, you know, for instance, we could say that if it is a project in excess of $5 million or $10 million, 
the, that becomes a tier one risk. Or if it is a project um, that fundamentally changes the ability for council to operate. Because you know, it's not just about money, but um, there may be some lower level risks that have the same impact. Oh, there's, there's no question that, in that, particularly in that reputation area, there can be some quite low financial impact risks, but very high uh, impact on the ability of the council to function. The other thing I, I may I? Sorry. Mm, please. Um, the, the other thing that, that this leads to is the draft council mark report uh, that we have received. We haven't got a final copy, so it may change, but the draft um, council mark report outlined an area for improvement was our anti risk framework. Uh, and I, I, I think, you know, Dave is looking at that in a bigger picture sense uh, of what you know the risk framework for the organization and I think any work that we do here would naturally feed into that is um, how we define a tier one project and how we measure the tier one or assess I should say the tier one risks I know I've used tier one twice there but in different senses mm. um, are, are applicable to this committee um, and I think that's a that's not an added task. That is a requirement that Council Mark have given us as a not a requirement. Forgive me, but mm. um, but guidance that that is an improvement opportunity for us. So I could see uh, the PMO delivering a, you know, here are the top five tier one risks that our audit risk committee wished us to, to have narrative on, uh, and we have a PMO report to, to this committee. Uh, on, on the top, whatever T1 projects are that are active. Yeah, I think for me the challenge is, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, for me the challenge is uh, the difference between the project management of a project yeah. and the governance of a project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think agree. those two quite different things. So in my mind, what would make me more comfortable is if I know that every project uh, has a proper risk register mm. that is recorded and and updated. And where it comes to the governance is that we inform them of the biggest risk on that list and if that list changes. Uh, but quite often on these lists, there's a whole lot of stuff. Uh, really what the governance arm would be interested in is what's the exposure to council and did our position change as we go through the project. And I think, I think those two things for me would give me comfort that any auditor at any time can grab that register and have a look at it and go, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Uh, it's how we report it back uh, in a less detailed fashion back to governance. So in my mind, that's kind of a, an ideal picture. I don't know. I don't know if that will work. Uh, so your error will show either flat or up or down, and we would be able to have a short summary on what's driving that. Thank you. Uh, look, I'm, I'm thinking that a, a bit of thought around um, what can I take on board the council mark advice. So I'm keen to have a look at, all right, where do we need to step up in terms of our um, risk framework? What do we need to do? And then, and then I guess from that, how does that then play out at an operational level? How do we make it happen? Um, and I guess I'm, I'm just testing myself in terms of, are there project risks? Does the project risk register cover everything, or are there risks that sit above, and I don't mean above that in terms of superiority, um, outside that, that are of uh, interest to council that are separate from the specific project risks? Um, I suspect there are. I think there are. Uh, for instance, from a governance point of view, um, one of the risks is that you don't um, get the functionality that you actually wanted out of the project. So, um, for instance, you could build um, a bus lane and you can spend a whole lot of money on it and design and so on, but if it actually doesn't achieve what it set out to achieve, then the functionality is a, is, you know, a major drawback and, and a huge reputational risk and a, and a waste of money. Um, probably thinking of a poor example here. Um, 
but making sure that what we actually are doing is fit for purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, His Worship makes a good point. I think it was definitely a position that was lacking in Council. Now that we have the PMO, it's quite different. So we have a, we have a, a, a project scope that specifies the outcomes that this project has to deliver. Mm. And we have a project sponsor that drives those outcomes. And it's more about the outcome of the project rather than the physical thing that we're going to build. What is the outcome that we are chasing? So now it's clearly defined. Mm. And at the end, in a roll-up, we can tick that box and say, yes, we have achieved that outcome. Uh, so it's a valid point, but I think we've, we've closed that gap with the PMO. Does, does the PMO have a... Um, and I'm thinking about these, and let's use a different phrase, but major projects, whatever, however they're defined, something that actually has a picture of those projects, and I guess um, the word I'm going to use is coherency across them in terms of outcomes. One of the, one of the problems that you often see, and I'll point to government departments, is that they have um, superbly run projects, but they're actually at counteracting. One's pushing in one direction and one's pushing in the other. And they're both done very well, but actually collectively um, it underperforms because of that. So it's the collective... Is there a collective view within the PMO of all of those major projects? That is a very good question. Uh, in my mind, if I may... German, I will point to... To that structure on that uh, on that co-fi leaf there, and what it is is we have a 30-year vision of what we are trying to achieve in this district, and everything we do, and every plan we have, and every strategy we have, and every project that we then generate out of those plans and strategies points to the same outcome that we are all driving. And it doesn't matter in the organisation if you're part of the PMO or at the front desk or wherever, we are all pointing in the same direction. So I think that kind of negates what you're saying that one project might actually be counted to just to another one because it all fits into that one structure that's all pointing in the same direction uh, and is very visible to the whole organisation. I don't know, Peter, if you've got a, a better reply than that. No, but I, the, my big smile was saying it all. <laughs> and I, I look, I, in the, as I was asking the question in the back of my head, I was saying, well, does the, does the long-term plan not actually address that fundamentally? Yes, <laughs> on the structure. <coughs> Yeah, so probably a better example may be, for instance, if, if you take the Papakai pump station, the outcomes they're setting are, are one, that you only over, get an overflow into a river in a 100-year type event. The second outcome may be that this pump station can cope with anticipated growth um, within that community if there was going to be a new housing development that feeds into it, etc. So there'd be a series of outcomes that would be, and that's what you're targeting, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I think it's a valuable discussion. Sorry, Nigel, to interrupt you. You're Jan at first. Nigel. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, completely agree with the discussion. I also think the introduction of the better business case models um, on some of our significant projects that are coming up um, have a huge input into um, you know, whether a project's going to be detrimental to another project within council or, or is it what the community want? And I think the introduction of that should be taken into account as well when we're dealing with, with risks, with, with bringing that better business case model in. It covers off a lot of questions that may be raised within the community. So um, that, that's, I can see that and, and I've seen that uh, by taking place in the one for the Martin Civic Centre, the difference that that makes and the questions that ask um, in the very early stages of the project. So that's that's another angle as well. All right, I think I'm seeing uh, three separate uh, actions or items out of this. First, using this as an example, um, so this straw man that we put together in terms of risks goes, as we've talked about, to the Rail Hub board for review, modification and substantial improvement. Um, secondly, there is a piece of work to look at, so what are the other major um, projects that should be considered in this group by 
auditing risk and what are the definitions that bring them there. And it, and it may be that there isn't a definition, it may be a judgment call by council that says we want it on that list because of all sorts of particular reasons, maybe political risk. Um, and the third then is uh, the um, upgrade in risk framework that we're using. And Dave, can I just check, is that, I know that you, there was a comment that you're working on that or have that on your radar. Is that something that's sitting with you? Yes, yeah, so basically we've approved recently the risk management policy. The risk management policy includes the framework which flows down to a risk management strategy that's work in progress, a risk appetite and tolerance policy, and then risk registers, a strategic risk register, which we know we've got, operational stroke departmental risk registers and project risk registers. So they're all going to flow out. But it doesn't, that doesn't mean we've got to wait for A to happen before B can happen. You know, we, so we've got A, we started B, we've got F, but we, we, and the project risk registers we all know are actually happening. I think what we're talking about is expanding or having a different shape for them to come to this committee. So, so yes, to answer your question, the framework is evolving, um, but we don't have to wait for other steps before we do what we're talking about here. Mm. And it will dovetail into the framework, Kim. So will there be, and I'm just thinking about um, timeline, for the next audit and risk meeting, a revised risk framework that would go some way towards addressing some of the council mark suggestions? It's, it's, it's not going to... I doubt it. The, the risk management strategy will hopefully be drafted in time for the next audit and risk committee. Right. Um, we can start certainly start on the operational departmental risk wages. We don't need to wait for the other stuff for them to be happening. Um, so the, the two big pieces of work are the risk management strategy and the risk appetite and tolerance policy. And they're big, it's just fine, just resources. You know, you need to put some dedicated time into this and that's where we're all struggling at the moment. Um, but project risk registers, departmental risk registers, they don't need to wait for me to draft them. They can be happening throughout the organisation. Would it be useful, um, and I'm just thinking about uh, John Nichols, who I've been talking to, is Chair of Audit and Risk for Hastings, Hastings District Council. And they, I don't know whether the council mark chaps have indicated anything, but certainly Audit New Zealand regard their risk work as um, a benchmark. Okay. So I'm very happy, and I'm sure John would share you know, all of their paperwork frameworks around us. Would that be useful as a... A straw again, another straw man. To yeah. Look at yeah. Yes, the short answer. I mean, I've got versions of risk management strategies that I'm plagiarising and uh, appetite and tolerance. Yeah, whatever they've got, I can certainly copy and paste. Because mm. Each council, to a large extent, the strategies and the policies are fairly generic. Yeah. Yeah. Was well, just that they were identified as being uh, yeah. an yeah. exemplar. Yeah. So sure. Yeah. Let's have yeah. a look. Yeah. And see. But at the same time, I don't want to dump. A whole bunch of reading it on, on your no, desk. I won't read, I'll copy and paste it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's not being recorded, is it? Yes. Mm. Oops. <laughs> so, Ash, if you could note that for me, please, and I'll source that information yeah, from thanks. John. All right. Members of the committee, any further thoughts or comments? And then we will just confirm our action steps from here. Nothing from Dave. Angus, no. Nigel, anything? Andy? No, but um, are you requiring a, a threshold limit, you know, on... On the major projects? Yeah. Um, we do have to define what sits in that list, and there will be... I mean, one of the filters is clearly going to be um, a financial one, but it won't be the only filter. So... Um, and perhaps the action is is that staff could come back to us with a recommendation about a recommendation. How they yeah. We we do well, we do that anyway for um determining if the project is managed by the PMO or if it's business as usual. So it's it's okay. natural. You've and got or, a filter. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, and it's on reputational risk, finance, whole you know, 
whole swag of things, but yes, yeah, so it's not a difficult thing to. We already have it. Right. Yeah. Well, if we if we have it, I mean, the question is, are there are there projects then that sit on the PMO, which we wouldn't want on that list? Because if it's just that filter, then we've we've got our criteria already established. Well, <coughs> then, then that's every project in the PMO. Yeah, well, that's what I'm asking. Is that too much? Yes. Right. Okay, no, that's cool. That's, that's, that's the purpose of the question. So the filter needs some, yeah, an yeah, additional yeah. level. Just uh, the, the volume is yeah. ranked up on each of them, yep. so you've got a high level. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Okay. So the, sort of the model is there. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's just the thresholds. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and look, it may be, oh, no, I was going to suggest that maybe that. Um, Audit and risk want to set a limit in terms of numbers of projects, but I actually don't like that. I'm, I'm kind of just my own thought because if, if a project is important, it should be there. Just a thought, and then we're talking bouncing around ideas. So obviously, dollars will be one of the factors, but also just looking at what we specifically identified in our LTP consultation document. Um, that might be something to think about because we went out to the public saying these are our key projects. So in terms of reputational risk, they're, they're visible things that the public's aware of and there's six or seven in there. I'm not saying it's an automatic by default they get included in this list, but another thing to think about mm -hmm. if they're high profile and public and we've consulted on them. Yeah. We'll make sure Absolutely you take them. Yeah. strikes me as a sort of criteria. Absolutely. So thank you. So that's the fourth uh, item. So just the, the clarities for stuff will provide that report. Correct. Thank you. What report, sorry? So that was the criteria. Right. So I just want to make sure we've got all these really clear. Yes. If that's okay. So maybe we can go through it. Is it okay? Absolutely. Yeah, because no, it's was... gone. Yep. Shotgun. Okay. Uh, so uh, the first section is using the rail hub report as an example, and that will go to the project advisory. Board as per Arnold's suggestion, and then to staff, and then the second action um, was. I think. Sorry, uh, are, they, are they the words you're comfortable with? Um, uh, thinking about it, I'm, as an example, I'm going to take that out. Just the word example. Just this risk goes to the project board for review. This straw man of risks. That that's just a particular it's in action. This paper. Yeah. Yeah. That was the, the first so the, the, in the project second. advisory board um, review the tier one risks outlined in paper 9.1. Step two was in the broader perspective about which projects uh, should audit and risk be reviewing risk status. So that was the, the criteria. Actually, just check, is that was that number two on the list? Yes, if there's a way to look at what other major projects should be considered. Right. Within tier one. And, as, and we could make a subset of that and start to come back with the criteria. Assessment criteria. Assessment criteria. Well, what determines a tier one project? Okay, yeah. then. Yep, thank you. And the third was then the generic risk framework. Yeah, uplift. Organisation one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon, anything from you? You're sitting there very quietly today. Um, no, I've got nothing to add to that discussion, but thank you for answering. Sure. All right, so with those um, recommendations or action items, do we have um, a mover and seconder? Please, Andy's moved, Nigel seconded. Thank you, all in favour? Against, carried. All right, Sorry. moving. Uh, Chair, was that just for the reception of the report? No, and those action. Moving those as a recommendation. Yes. <coughs> Sorry, Ash, I wasn't watching the screen. I was thinking about them as one group. Okay, so I just need to make sure you've got the words exactly as you wish them to be as a recommendation.
um, when received. Okay, we don't have that final report on this. So it's all right. Yep. And, I, and my sort of expectation is that, as coming back to what Dave said, that this will not be finalised in three months' time, but there'll be an update. Mm. Just for those online, the um, recommendation to now reflects what the actions were. Um, so are, are you happy, Councillor Belsham, to second that still? Uh, yes, yes, I can't see it, but um, if it was as what <laughs> previously, I'm happy. We have a mover for the receipt. So, yeah, mover and a seconder for the receipt of the report. Receipt of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Again, all in favour? Against, carried. So, on to reports for uh, information. Predict, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, oh, I've got... I'm happy to, to move. Um, the recommendation the protected disclosures update be, re be just received. There's nothing in it, so I don't see it as contentious. Happy to second that. I, I concur. Any any comments, questions? Dave? Yeah, just, just one quick one for me. Um, um, very, I mean, obviously, this is a great a great thing that we have in place this this policy and and uh, and to enable that for the protection of our our staff and contractors and things where do we do, where do we display that how often do we sort of let people hey know this document's out there you know do we do we just sort of say we've got it and tick it off and file it away or are we actively promoting some of these things that say that we've we um live and breathe them rather than just just talk the talk we walk it as well just wondering sharon it's probably one for you yeah, sure. Um, so we, we do have it displayed on our um, intranet site, Kapua, and um, it's uh, promoted to uh, all new staff when they go through the orientation process and every time there's a change to the policy that's communicated as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, can I move a mover and seconder, please, for the receipt of that report? Oh, we have, we, sorry, we have yeah. got all of that. That was a question afterwards, thank you. I don't think you voted on that. No, that's right, you just need to vote on No, we didn't. So, all in favour? Please say aye or raise your hand, thank you. Against, carried. Health, safety, and well-being. Now, Sharon, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I will take the report as read, but there are three areas that I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, firstly, in relation to the dashboards, there are two dashboards attached to this report, but they do cover three months of reporting, and that's simply due to the December and January reporting being combined in one dashboard. Uh, all the incidents and near misses identified in the dashboard have been investigated and where required corrective actions are in place. And also noting that there were no uh, notifiable events or incidents to WorkSafe uh, during that reporting period. So in other words, there was no serious harm. Uh, my second point to note is in relation to the due diligence plan, uh, we are progressing through that well. Uh, the next work is done session will be scheduled as soon as possible, taking into account the current COVID situation, and we will combine the sessions for the parks and reserves and the loan worker session into one, just to make up that little bit of time we've lost due to the um, COVID challenges. And um, my final point is that I'd just really like to share one of our um, health, safety and wellbeing work program highlights. Uh, that is an initiative that we're rolling out called Stop Take Five. Uh, this resulted um, through learnings from um, a number of near misses and sort of a trend that we were noticing in terms of um, near misses and incidents with, um, you know, heavy plant, things like uh, mowers, trucks, trailers. Now, none of those were serious harm, 
but I guess what they presented was a really good learning opportunity. And I think this is a great example of um, our no blame, continuous improvement approach. And really that is the type of safety culture that we are aiming for. Uh, so just really briefly, um, stop take five is it's a it's a shift in thinking and it's something that uh, staff undertake before a new activity commences. Um, essentially, the five steps are stop, identify the hazards, assess risk, control the hazards, and then proceed and monitor. Um, we actually see a sixth step within that, um, and that is trusting and empowering our people to do the right thing and then backing them when they do. So we're trialling this within the Parks and Reserves team and um, you'll certainly hear more about it when we do that work is done session. And we're really excited about seeing how that goes, getting some feedback and looking at rolling it out to some of our other areas. Um, I'm really happy to take any questions. Any questions, comments? Nigel. Yeah, um, just on that last initiative, I, I think it's a fantastic initiative. I know it was raised um, in an ELT meeting that both Andy and myself attended. And um, just the initiative, I think, um, you know, in everyday life, everybody needs to take a bit of a breather and, and think about what they're about to undertake. And um, for that to become part of this culture of this council, I think is um, fantastic. And um, it really shows the change, the change or shift in culture um, towards health and safety. So yeah, uh, congratulations and well done on implementing it. And um, yeah, I hope it, um, it moves right across the organisation. Thank you. I, if I didn't quite catch it, I must about where it's at in terms of its rollout, because I'm interested if, there, if it has <coughs> feedback from staff, what sort of early so we're, Thoughts, we're, comments. we're early in those stages sure. um, and we're early in the stages of rolling it out with the Parks and Reserves team. Uh, the initial feedback has been um, really positive. Um, the, the teams are you know, really excited, really engaged and they, they, they get it, they see how it will work and I think um, it, it works in a practical sense for the work that we do. Um, so yeah, we've discussed it with them. Um, we've got some collateral being developed as little little check, little reminders, um, you know, little stickers, little posters around stop, take five and what that means. Um, and once we can get the whole team together, we will do more of a training session in, in the use of it and, and get some feedback on progress so far. Excellent, well done. Angus has a question. Angus. So will those five or six points, will they be somehow pulled together in a, in a document and displayed somewhere? And I mean, I know you, you, you verbally listed them uh, and I don't see them all on the report. So is that going to become a core piece of kit? Yes, it will eventually once we roll it out. We, we want to keep it as simple as possible and we don't see stop taking five, stop take five is having to go through a whole a complex procedure. It's more mm. of a behaviour and a way of thinking. But our vision is to, yes, we would have some, some stickers and some, some posters developed that identify what those five steps are. And we will have some more detailed documentation to back that up. But certainly we want to make it as simple, easy and non-complex as possible. Excellent, thank you. All right, members of the committee, any further questions? No, we need to um, receive this report. Thank you. Just getting more comprehensive. Sorry, Fee, did you have a question? Moving the report, I think. You're not allowed to. Nice, nice thought, but want, yeah, we can't allow you to move this to. Sorry, okay. That's okay. <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> Angus has moved and Dave has seconded. All in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. So Dave, moving on to you in terms of summary of management accounts. Yeah, so just to recap, what we've done previously 
copied the full report that used to go to Finance and Performance Committee, um, and we said last time that we just do a, a summary. Yeah. So what I've done here is um, summarise the mid-year budget review that was taken to Finance and Performance Committee last month. Uh, as always, as soon as you write one of these things, you become aware of other stuff. Other, but no, um, most of the most of the items that have arisen since I wrote this are just timing differences, i.e., maybe a capital grant that we've got budgeted for this financial year or flow into next financial year. All right, questions. And I've um, I've won from a, just an accounting treatment perspective, which was intriguing around the first quarter PMO wages have been capitalised. Um, something I'm in favour of, and this is great if you can um, to do this. Is that something that you are intending to look at in terms of the PMO to capitalise as much as possible of the expenses and wages against it, if it is justified? If it's justified, yeah. We've been doing that for as yeah. long as the PMO has been in operation. Great. Yeah. And Audit, Audit New Zealand are very comfortable. If if we are, if it's the, the keyword's appropriate. Yes. So if it's appropriate, we capitalise it. Happy days. Um, okay. We just got to make sure we get that split right between what's opex and what's capex. Yeah. And I'll um, I'll have that conversation with you after the meeting, if I may, about where some of those boundaries might lie. Yeah. In yeah, particular, sure. at what stage of the project yeah. does it start to be able to be capitalised? Mm. There, there were four items raised in last financial year's management letter, and this, this is one of them. Right. Just, just got to be um, conscious of the split, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, folks, any other questions regarding the management accounts update? No, Andy, nothing? The, yeah, I mean, the only one I've wondered wondered about is, um, especially in the Three Waters area, is whether we have the ability to look at the depreciation schedule on them, especially for the new works. So, for instance, if if you're putting in, as we're putting in the new wastewater mine from, say, Martin to Bulls, whether and I've sort of raised this sort of issue before as to whether we have any ability to to change the depreciation schedule or to offset it in the first two years, for example, because it will make quite a significant difference to our rating position of an asset that's going to be handed over in 2024. And comments on that? It might be seen as being cute but the effects of it are, are quite substantial in terms of um, our operating budgets. Yeah. So basically nothing will get depreciated until the project's finished. And uh, there's a, the accounting depreciation, it will be depreciated as per accounting standards. No choice about that. Uh, the, query, the question then becomes, do we rate for that depreciation or not? Yeah, yeah that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. And that, that, that's our decision if we choose not to rate for it, like, as we do for other of our um, infrastructure. But would that have to be a decision that is made at going into this annual plan? Essentially, what I'm getting at here is, you could, say you've got 10 million yeah. and for a wastewater line, for example, and it has a 20-year life, yeah. then that's by my reckoning, that's half a million dollars a year as an operational expense. That's 2% on rates, or close to it. Yeah. But if you could get away with saying, we're not going to rate for that depreciation, and when would we have to make that decision on an asset that we're not going to end up owning? And because the depreciation, the loan function of it, we get back. But the depreciation schedule, I don't know, and nor does anybody else know. <clears throat> the, the, the pipeline won't be depreciated next year unless the project's finished at 30th of June. I'm looking at Arno and thinking it won't be finished at 30th of June, will it? Yes, the it pipeline will be. The 
pipeline will be yeah. function, fully functional. Yes. Well, it will be done, completely finished. The, sorry, <laughs> the, the, you were, may I? The mm, contract please. will be fulfilled. Not, the, yeah. the pipeline is different to the project. Mm. So the project is $25 million. Yes. The pipeline is a subcomponent of the project. So it's, it won't have any water running out of it that way. Um, yeah. But I think his worship makes the point that in terms of the transfer of asset in the future, we don't know if um, the water services entity or there'll be some legislation around handing over our accumulated depreciation that mm. goes with the asset. Mm. We don't know. Yeah. So if we stop rating for it, we might still have to pay it. Yes. It's just unknown. Hands up. All right. Uh, Dave, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And on the subject, and I may be completely wrong, but it's my understanding that we can't rate for any projects until those projects are completed. And I think I did hear that in the discussion. So um, I may be wrong in that. So that would account for depreciation as well as being a rating factor because we can't forward rate. We can only post rate. Is that is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yes, you, you rate to cover your operating expenses, yes. Yes, but that is at the completion of a project, not at the beginning of a project. Yeah, yeah, you, you start depreciating when the projects, the, the financial year following completion of the project. So the, the matter that we're referring to is unlikely to be completed prior to the time of any three waters assets handover, so therefore there would be no depreciation in the uh, first couple of years of our of our LTP review, possibly. No, Andy. No, because in my opinion, no, because um, the contract for that work, the pipeline going into the ground is a contract. And when that contract is fulfilled, then it would have a depreciation schedule irrespective of whether it's part of a wider project. Um, it's a capital work that is, in, that is in place this year. And you're dead right, it would be, it would be rated for and depreciated um, in the next financial year. Um, but what I'm saying is that the decision to depreciate fund does that have to be made and going into an annual plan? I know it's it's sort of technical in nature, but it does have a fairly serious impact. It's a material impact. Nigel. Um, yeah, so one of my questions was, when is an asset capitalised? So I guess that's at the end of the completion of the project. Is that the answer? Well, I know, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, if, uh, how, the, how the process works is at the end of uh, a project, we update our asset database uh, through Asset Finder and the value of the total value of the asset changes. And that's, that's how that works. So the depreciation is, is worked out on the total uh, value of the asset. So there'll be a store in a network, a wastewater network, and a drinking water network, amongst other assets. Uh, and that's that's how that works. So the moment it's completed and captured on Asset Finder, the value changes. Yeah. So is that when the pop, when the pipeline's installed and that part of the project has been finalised, that will be capitalised? Is that correct? No. So what happens is at the end of a construction project, uh, there's one last deliverable, which is the as-built drawings of what's been constructed. The moment we receive the as builds, that gets updated into Asset Finder uh, with the value of the contract. So that's kind of at the back end of the completion of the construction. I guess what I'm trying to get to is, so the total final project, so the wastewater treatment plant is, is connected and the pipeline's been utilised, is that the time when it's capitalised? Or is it when, it's, when the project has been, the, the actual pipeline is installed, that part of the, the contract has been finalised and is, it, is that pipeline then capitalised? 
Yes, yeah, so in my view, uh, the moment we receive the S-bills of a completed project, uh, the value of our asset has increased by whatever the value of that project was. Uh, I think this might be an action that we take this offline it's a good idea. and just actually confirm when each component of this project will be capitalised and uh, depreciated, and it might flow into, as mm. his Worship said, some discussion about annual plan about depreciation and rating for. It's, it's important. It it's is. a really good idea because also we've got the water, uh, the Martin Water Strategy, which is a two and a half year project as well, and it's going to be a similar thing. So we're going to have a bore, but we can't really use the bore until we have a plant, and uh, so it's all kind of interdependent. And I'll take on board what Peter is saying. Yeah. There's a difference between, and Andy is correct, the completion of a contract and the completion of a project. Yes. And I suppose it's how we view those things uh, as to where this falls. So I agree with Dave. We'll have a look at it. So thank you, please. But there is a finite moment in time and that is the setting of the annual plan because that's when the financial aspects of this kick into place yeah because it becomes part of the depreciation schedule sure. and ascribed uh, uh, against rates i'm fairly sure myself arno and danny can yes. come to the conclusion of the, the capitalization within half an hour yep. yes yep. councillor wilson Dave. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, look, it just seemed to me that there's a little bit of uh, ambiguity around a clear answer on this one. And Andy's quite right. We, we do want to go into our, into our long-term planning with a fairly definitive answer on this one. Can I suggest that somewhere along the line, those offline conversations, we test this with audit so that um, it doesn't uh, crop up anywhere further down the line after a significant amount of work has been, has been put through? Just my thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Um, so we have the action sitting with Arno and Dave to take uh, that conversation and come back with a, a, a defined and tested answer. Indeed. So Ash, you've got that trapped. Thank you. Um, on that basis, we need to receive uh, this report, which was um, stimulated some very good discussion. Thank you. So, thank you, Dave, and a seconder. Thank you, Nigel. All in favour, it's receipt. Against, carried. Thank you. Fraud reporting. Anything to comment? It's very self explanatory. I'm happy Nothing to, to report. Sorry, Andy, did I hear you say you're happy to move its receipt? Yep. I'm happy to second. Any further questions, commentary? No? All in favour? Against? Carried. Insurance update. So just to... Um Take it as read, but section 2.2, just the mic just uh, raise them issues. As we all know, in insurance costs going up, I would say, significantly each year. That's um, greater than CPI anyway, and that's not going to stop. Um, when we divest ourselves of our water assets, insurance will come down, of course, but um, we'll lose a whole chunk of revenue as well. So always looking at ways of doing things smarter with um, insurance. I was contemplating cancelling or self-insuring, looking at self-insuring our professional indemnity. Mm -hmm. It comes with a whole bunch of risks, as we're all aware. Um, we all know as soon as you cancel insurance, you're going to get a claim. It's just the way the world works. But I, I just like to point out to the, this committee that uh, our professional indemnity insurance that does cost us uh, 60k a year. We've yet to have a claim on it. So I, I started off contemplating whether we do self-insure, so we just put a similar sort of money in the separate bank account each year and have a buffer fund sitting there. Uh, our insurance agent was quite specific in his advice, bearing in mind he is our agent, um, that of all the insurances, this is one we should tread very carefully about self-insuring. Like if you get a claim, it can be huge. 
I'll be interested to see if there's any thoughts around this committee about either increasing the deductible or self-insuring or just keeping on playing safe with professional indemnity. See if there is any thoughts. Yes, indeed. I certainly have some thoughts. But committee members, any comments, thoughts in terms of item 2.2 and those cha potential changes? Nigel. Yeah, thank you. Um, with those comments provided that we haven't had a claim, but if we did have one, and potentially it would be uh, it would be a large claim on something like this professional indemnity. Um, the the option two under two point two in the report to increase the deductible to two hundred and fifty thousand per claim um, would be um, attractive um, to certainly reduce some of the um, some of the premium costs there. That's from uh, my perspective. Thank you. Dave. Uh, yes, thank you. I looked at this one um, and on a first thought, thought, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe we could play around with this one a wee bit and, and yeah, self-insuring is one thing. But if you start to think about the significant uh, projects and programs that are in front of us, um, I would be strongly recommending that we keep this one in place because we, uh, we could face some potential risks from some of these significant infrastructure programs that are in place. So I'd be certainly thinking that we'd want to keep it. Um, on the face of it though, for increasing a deductible to 250K to save sort of 15 to $16,000, sometimes when you look at insurance, you can play around with the numbers and the savings are, are quite negligible, but open to hear more from the committee on that one. Oh, look, I was I was going went down exactly the same path, Dave, and saying to myself, well, okay, save 16k, one claim at the max, <clears throat> and you know the 15, 16 years payback time. I, I'm conscious, and I've heard the same, Dave. I've heard Aon talk about um, PI being one of the more litigious areas. It's the it's the claim category that is claimed against most. In local government. So even though this council hasn't had any claims, I would be interested in and what would help inform my thinking about this is, is there any way we can get data that says across, and it might be councils of similar size or something like that, what's been the pattern of claims over the last five years? Not just with this council, but is it typical in New Zealand that on average, a council of you know, less than 50,000 ratepayers has two claims at this average value per year. And I don't know whether that information is available, but I would have thought that the likes of Aon could provide that. And that then gives you at least a criteria against which to say, on average, this would look like a smart bet or no, it's not. Yeah, I, I, as a starting point, I do. I have been sent a summary of PI claims against local governments. I can't find it at the moment, but I might circulate that after outside this meeting. Just provide some sort of info. Mm. Yeah. Andy, your thinking. Um, my question with this report is: What's the aim of this report? we can't make the decision, we don't have that determination. So is this a recommendation back to council or is this advice that we've received from council because this, there has been discussion around this in finance? Okay, well, um, so the purpose of this is, 2.1 is the summary of insurance claims. The purpose of 2.2 .2 is to show, demonstrate to the council that we are proactively thinking about managing our insurance cover and whether yeah, we're just looking to see whether it's still yeah. fit for purpose. It's 2.2. 2. Is this a recommendation that we should adopt this? A recommendation from audit and risk? Otherwise, we're just receiving it and it goes nowhere. Yeah, yeah. It was designed yeah, for, for us to um, demonstrate that we are looking at whether the current policy is fit for purpose and to invite discussion. So can I suggest, Dave, uh, firstly, if you... Do you have any recollection of that sort of summary and looking at it, does that look like this might be a sensible way forward, i.e. increasing the deductible? 
in which case it would need to come back to audit and risk with a recommendation. And with that information, that summary. I'm happy that we recommend the council to consider this. Absolutely. And I think um, that's the, with the, saying I'm quite happy that, that we put forward a recommendation that the council looks to adopt this or whatever. And then the, there'll be more information or whatever, but it will has to has to be a council decision. Yeah. At the end of the day. Yeah, so I wasn't looking for this committee to make a decision to change the insurance cover. No, just have some discussion around what they might think is worth investigating. Okay. <coughs> Angus. So, Chair, are we jumping the gun a little bit um, going straight to Council? I feel that if we had that summary information, we could make a, a, a more educated call before even putting it on the Council agenda. I, I think all we can do here is um, commend the scrutiny, um, the continued scrutiny of insurance costs um, and um, request that if there are uh, if there is a solid business case, then it comes back as a solid business case for any changes in the area that might lead to, but it does not necessarily lead to a, a cost saving. It may, you may actually be increasing, recommending an increase. But I think fundamentally all we are uh, encouraging is uh, the continued scrutiny of costs in this area, which I think, Dave, is what you are. Yeah, yeah. Are you happy with that? Thanks, Angus. Um, so I'm sorry. So, was there an action there? No, there's not. No, no. Okay. no it's, it, if Dave wishes to progress this, that sits with him once he's had a look at the, the data. On that basis, we need to uh, receive this paper. A mover and a seconder. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Dave. All in favour? Against carried. Internal audit program. So again, happy to take as as read and uh, invite any questions or queries. Just a comment: when when at first when ethics first first came up in the paper, I was searching for what was the breadth of oh, the yes. um, scope of activities. And I'm delighted to see that it's the breadth as indicated later on. Is there any other comments, reactions, thoughts? Sir, uh, for, for, forgive me, and I, 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 um, I realise I'm not part of the committee, um, but I, I would encourage um, point three under ethics to be represented differently. Um, what, what I anticipate the committee would wish for is that um, that council operate um, with knowledge on our supply chain and the ethics of our supply chain. <clears throat> not that our procurement is conducted in an ethical manner. Um, it's a step further than just the function of procurement. Mm -hmm. It is the people that supply us have ethic, uh, ethical policies and sourcing, etc. Yep. Um, so, for example, if we had a large provider, uh, or for example, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of an example, mm. but a, a product that, that we buy and we find that it's from you know, source through slave labour or, or something, then, then that's the supply chain rather than just the process of procurement. So, yeah, um, good, good point, Peter. Um, on page uh, 47 is what we actually sent out to the internal auditor who's going to be conducting this risk, and it does talk about social procurement, doing business with social enterprises, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I should have um, amended the, the cover paper to include more of them details. Thanks, Dave. Angus. Thank you. So to follow on with 
Peter's comment there, do we have access to um, accurate information that would indicate which supply chains may be suspect and which are completely safe, in inverted commas? It would be very difficult for us, you know, as, a, as an individual council, to go into China and figure out whether a pipe manufacturing company you know, use a slave labor in a, in, a, in a factory in the back of Tajikistan or somewhere. I mean, that, that's just out of our scope. So how, what processes do we have that, we, or, or does someone else have that we can rely on? Can I answer that? So, yes, please. So um, bottom of page 47, Councillor, is the scope of the review. And this, this is kind of exactly what we we're asking the internal auditor to come up with. What, what can we practically do to enhance um, our ability to embrace these principles. If I may, yes. <clears throat> um, I, I've been lucky in, in previous employment to do a lot of work in this area. And, um, uh, and every organisation will have an appetite for how far through the supply chain they want, you would wish us to look at. Uh, um, so, um, there are some organisations I've worked with that are very um, high profile that wanted to, to know at a, quite a detailed level. Um, so, for example, in the electronics world, um, is it the product or the constituent parts within the product? And in the electronic world, you can go right down, 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 down to a individual transistor or chip on a, on a capacitor on a board. So at what part of the supply chain do you stop? And normally it's evidenced by an organisation having the policies that Dave's um, put out on page 47. Mm. And it allows the ability for an individual to, for, for that organisation to be audited at any time. And I don't suggest that we would go to that length. Um, we would be at the, the lighter touch, but it's this is social procurement that, that, that we're satisfying ourselves. That it, um, and this is a really important setting, I think, for council. Whilst this is not a real live example, but it's the one I've used with my staff before. Um, if we supply um, bananas for uh, a, 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 a cater bananas for a um, for a particular event, and we have a choice of getting supplier A giving us bananas at two dollars or supplier B giving us bananas for $5, but we know that bananas B are um, ethical and that fair trade policies apply, and we knew that bananas A were you know, picked by juveniles or whatever, or that there's something that really confronts us as an organisation, then we're knowingly going to go for B and pay more. That is a setting that that I think this committee should be giving us yes. um, because we are going to pay more for those that we know, at least we know. And this is really where I, I well, it is um, captured in this statement and in this work um, that this committee is satisfied that we do consider ethical supply chain as part of our procurement systems. Thank you. Um, I'm wary of us going too deeply into this. We have, within less, half a dozen different councils, all buying the same sorts of product, all, all providing the same sorts of services, that if you're going to go down this track, why not have a, a joint position from less? Or if there is work to be done on it, then at least it is shared between half a dozen different councils. Uh, I can, um, I think I'm going to support the perspective, and I think that was illustrated, um, but I'll, I'll come back to Andy's comments, because yes, that's how we should address it. The um, perfect example on the radio yesterday, and I think it was BP, it may not have been, uh, but one of the major oil companies said, oops, sorry, our last two shipments were from Russia, and we organised that in the last couple of weeks. Um, we won't be doing that again. So clearly that was a, a slip up on their part, but it comes back to, and that, that was at a discount. They got a, a discount, naturally enough. But Andy, just on that, that 
is a practical solution um, for less, and if we look at the inter less activities, they're plenty less, is very much a procurement focused less, very, and, and is doing procurement for the MW less as well. Very focused on social procurement and what are the settings in that area. I, I, we haven't expanded into supply chain, but I will take that back <coughs> to the Bay of Plenty Less and ensure that that's part of their setting as well. Um, because I think that's a consistent policy that would sit comfortably with all councils. Dave. Dave. Yes, thank you, Chair. And very, very quickly, I think Peter, you raised a raised a, 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 quite a good analogy there. Sitting throughout this conversation, the thought comes to me that it is purely and simply a test on our own organisation's ethics as being the as being the benchmark uh, <coughs> to raise a concern, and that that should be uh, throughout the organisation for for the procurement. So the test point is: does it sit? With the organisation at a personal and professional uh, professional level uh, as an ethics matter, and if it does, then the question needs to be investigated further. Um, how far down the line it goes after that is a secondary thing, but the first test point is: does it sit within our own ethics uh, uh, on a personal mm -hmm. level and a uh, organisational level before we test the water any further? Thank you. Anything further? All right, so internal audit program, anything of an ethics I thought was always going to trigger the interesting conversations. Anything, any other comments or questions on the internal audit program? Um, just in 3.2.5, provide an updated current schedule of all legislation that council is required to comply with. Good luck with that. It's changing on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, yes. I'm just making the comment. That's all. No, I know. I mean, it's it's yes. Yeah. It's just a hyperlink to legislation.co.nz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally. Just relevant. Yes. Even that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I've been involved in similar conversations, Andy. Around, you know, what do you, what do you put in? Um, you know, and you you bat around words like relevant, practical, uh, and all of them are weasel words, sadly. Well, the three waters. They are yet to enact legislation, but they're already saying this, 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 it's all over the show. Yes, there's compliance issues cropping up everywhere, absolutely. Well, can we, do, do you wish to see a modification to that word? Andy, I think we can. No, I was just making the point. Yeah. Well, well, point. Well received, thank you. On that basis, can we uh, receive this report? Move on the seconder, please. Thank you, Dave. Angus is, oh no, Nigel, got no, Nigel got in ahead of you, thank you, Angus. All in favour? Against, carried. Right, Treasury reporting. Yeah, I'm happy to take as read. Um, I think that shows there that uh, we're comfortably, as most councils are, within three of the four covenants. Uh, the fourth covenant's the one that's proving to be the most sensitive for some councils, but not us. We would add that that's still at a comfortably low level compared to the rest of our balance sheet. Of course, this will all change after three waters. These covenants will have to change. That's the point. It's mm. a point I was going to make. Mm. We need a very clear understanding of what our position will be against these covenants as of um, 2024. My, these covenants will have to change. Mm. 
what specifically would be the trigger um, that says maybe the legislation, uh, if the timelines are identified on that and the actions, that would I'm just trying to think through when when would we program to say okay if this event happens we then need to revisit the covenants. It's probably legislation, is it? Yeah. So 2024, when you what happens is. Yes, sure, our debt will pass over, but you're dropping $10 million a year of income, so our income to debt position will be substantially changed. Absolutely. And that's the one that I'm wary of, it's income, it's income to debt, because we're going down the path of capital build of buildings, you know, so we put 35, 40 million into into buildings in the next two to three years, my bet is that we're going to be outside our self-imposed limits. And I do note that Wellington, for instance, this morning put out a position to say that it's going to be not until 2028 that they will fall back within their own limits. In other words, they're saying we're way outside them now and we won't get back within them till 2028, at the very least, so. Yeah. Well, I might just add that our covenants are based on the LGFA covenants, and the LGFA will have to change their covenants because there'll be more councils not complying with these than will be. Absolutely. So, so this is really, the, the next two years, these will apply, and then it'll be um, rescoped. So you're obviously in a position where you can't set covenants that are more uh, tolerant than you are funders because um, they wouldn't yeah, then, but, 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 obviously, but you can be more conservative. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think we're in that position. I think we're a little bit more <coughs> conservative than the um, LGFA limits or advice. Uh, no, that's my the, understanding. No, we, we, they are copy and paste from okay. LGFA, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, thank you. That's useful to know in terms of yeah. um, headroom. Or lack thereof. Folks, anything further on Treasury report? Angus, was that you suggesting you had a question or just just waving? Well done. Thank you. In that case, mover and seconder for the Treasury report, please. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Dave. All in favour? Against? Carried. All right, three waters. Yes, uh, this arose out of our previous comment. I think that this committee wants to start um, reviewing potential financial impacts of the three waters reform. Absolutely, and thank you. It's good to see it here. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think everyone knows there's still more questions and answers around a lot of this stuff, but. Um, what I've done here is I've pulled out the long-term plan, a year four, three waters related figures, just so we can start getting a, an understanding of, of what it may mean. In, in, in a admittedly simple sense, but at this stage, um, it's, it's really just to be aware of the, the size of the figures we have related to three waters. Andy. It vindicates my figure that I took to council um, the month ago of 10 million of income drop. Um, I was actually quite pleased to see the Erewhon report and, and actions to some extent um, earlier in the meeting because we're currently in an interesting position with one of our rural water schemes where they're going to need um, extensive investment and projected at $3 million over the next few years. And there are a couple of members from that group saying, we can do it ourselves better at a cheaper price. Um, and the, this report also makes comment around the rural water scheme. So there's a couple of bodies of work here. One is making sure that we absolutely have clear indication of if, if somebody looks to withdraw, what are their obligations back to the council and scheme? 
And secondly, there is work being done by a working party uh, set up through DIA on rural water. So that's just about the aspects of rural water in there and then retention of those, those assets. Again, it's a part of the three waters group that nobody has any real detail over. Dave. Yes, thank you. Question for, uh, for Mr. Toombs. And, and looking at these figures, um, and it is, it is a good report because I think, as you, as you said, it, the question was raised that we should start to get our head around where the numbers are going to be at. What I couldn't work out from looking at looking at this, and it is, I know it's at a very, very high level start. Given the information that you can see um, there and what we have in place for us for our long-term plan at present, to me, doesn't stack up as it sits right there. It's, it's unaffordable to attain as these figures look here with what the predictions are saying for our... Um, significant capital works program under over the next 10 years. Am I right in saying that? Well, so I'm not I'm sure I understood. The, the well, I guess if you if you look at the uh, where you're indicating the um, the difference in the figures will be and as, as the mayor has just mentioned, mentioned a, a drop in income of um, you know $10 million and, and, and these are just really first first looks at some of these numbers. Our capital works program that we've set in our long-term plan, which we're about to review, quite simply doesn't work on these numbers that we've, what, we've, uh, what we've got sitting here in front of us as it sits right now. It's unaffordable. Well, we can't, we couldn't fund it given the earlier conversation with regards to our um, treasury and financial borrowing limits. Uh, no, I think all these figures have a straight up a long-term plan. Uh, can I and attempt to clear that up? Oh, with a reduction of $10 million within that. The, the, the ratio of income to debt changes. If we have $10 million less income, do we have enough space to build the Martin Civic Centre, the Thai PE? So all the remaining capital spent on the new income, is that going to be a problem? Okay, there's a few variables there. If A lot of it depends upon how much that water-related debt we are given. Uh, our books show that we've got $30 million worth of water-related debt. So we don't know if we're going to get that. We don't know if we're going to get a percentage of that. Um, and the the debt covenants to which you refer, they might be completely, well, they, they, they will be completely changed. So our, our ability to raise debt revenue won't be um, driven by the existing covenants. So, yes, um, so our ability to raise debt in year seven, um, based on the long term, the long term plan said yes, we could cover the debt, but what the debt covenants will be in year seven of the long term plan, we don't know. Yes, this is the issue that I've been trying to bring to council attention for the last few months. We just simply don't know. Absolutely. And, um, because, um, Dave, you're focusing first of all on the on the ten million dollar drop of drop of income, but potentially there's thirty odd million that comes back to council, and there is potentially all the better, you know, no worse off business cases, all of that sort of stuff. We haven't actually got figures on that, no. so. That's that's the huge dilemma for council to try and understand its financial position as of the end of 2024, um, because there is quite a promises of substantial money coming back in. It's not only better business, no worse council off sort of stuff, but there's also um, incentive payments that are separate to that as well. Um, I don't. I don't know the answers, but I suspect that we will be struggling with our debt limits because of the high amount of capital work that we'll be doing 
that's not associated with three waters. That's why I'm concerned about things like the depreciation schedules, etc. Government is still yet to be able to tell us um, whether any depreciation that we have charged on those assets should be returned to the entity as well. I've asked that question and I haven't got an answer because they just don't understand it. So the policies around this whole transition is something that um, government and DIA are trying to look at, at the, currently at the moment. Uh, sorry, Arno, you had a comment. Thank you, on. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, it's something that's come up earlier in the discussion earlier as well that I thought popped into my mind and now again. Uh, we also have to remember that there is the reform in local government happening in the background, and we don't know what that's going to look like. So there has been quite a substantial amount of talk about additional functionality for council. Uh, potentially that could increase income again. So it's, it's just a mix of unknowns, and I think we can get really stuck on those unknowns if we're not, care if we're not careful. So I think I kind of agree with, with Dave. We manage things as it stands and will change with it as it changes. Mm. But there are so many unknowns, it's, it's impossible to predict where it's going to fall. I think my um, purpose in seeing this type of uh, initial analysis was very much about starting to identify the questions that you need to keep asking, not to make decisions, because we just don't know. There are far too many variables at play. Uh, and Arno's right, there's in, you know, externalities as well that you know, are going to play in the space. But if you get, if you start to really focus on what are these questions, things like capacity for debt and so on, then you, as elements become clearer, <laughs> you can react faster with more certainty. However, there is a trigger point here. So, for instance, the better business case for Martin and Thai Happy replacement processes. Going down through the better business case is, is absolutely the right thing to do and the amount of money that's involved in those better business case analysis is very low. But within our LTP, there's a signing process to build. And that triggers before 2024. So it'd be imprudent of council to, to sign a contract to build a centre that could be you know, 20, $25 million without actually knowing whether we'll have the ability to be able to fund it. That's the trigger point. And that occurs ahead of 2024, according to our schedules as we currently sit. Absolutely understand that. Okay, so I, I think rather than, I mean, there, there isn't anything we can specifically do, like I said, I think it's very much about having these conversations so that they become part of the regular analysis of where are things. Absolutely. And what can we do and what can we not do. So I very much appreciate uh, the work here, Dave. Thank you. Um, and no doubt there will be regular updates as, I won't say as things clarify, because I'm not convinced <laughs> that will happen that quickly. All right. Um, last chance, anything further on this particular paper? Hey. Sorry, the, the mute button. Um, I found that paper really valuable, and I just wonder, um, is it possible for it to go um, around wider council or, or not? And you call? Just, just to respond, all, all councillors get a copy of the audit risk agenda. Sure, but if it was identified as um, something that they, you know, brought to their attention, I think it would be really beneficial. Yeah, look, the, um, Fee, this is in the public ar arena as part of the agenda, and yes, it, in my opinion, would be appropriate to, to first of all send it out to councillors so they're aware <coughs> um, and could form part of a you know, council paper. I think that that's a discussion that, that Peter can have with the ELT as to how you advise. 
Thank you. Um, I, th I think the only uh, comment I would make is that the introduction needs to be specific about the fact that this isn't about um, definitive information to make decisions. It is very much about um, the picture as we know it today with some with many uncertainties. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, we need to move and second the receipt of this paper. This time Angus is going to put his hand up. Thank you. And Dave, thank you. Seconded. In favour? Against? Carried. Now, review of Treasury and finance policies and strategies. Yeah, I think it's just part of the internal audit annual plan. Um, we look at these as we approach the end of the financial year to see if there's anything that jumps out that needs addressing. So, again, take the papers around. I think it's self-explanatory. And, and as you say, in each of them, no required amendments identified. Um, um, Andy. The only question I had with regard to this item was, and um, we talk in there about the, the forestry rating differential. Did we need to have anything in this paper around um, the change of policy from housing and centre that Council has looked at? The range emissions policy. Yeah, uh, it doesn't form part of any of these three policies. Okay. Has anything come up recently? Um, and I didn't cross-reference this with the audit reports, and I meant to. Is the audit identified anything in this space in the last? three to five years that you can recall. I don't recall anything. No. 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 Members of the committee, questions? No. Anything, Nigel, from, from you? Uh, no, other than perhaps what Andy spoke about before with the um, with the depreciation rates and and does that make up part of the revenue and financing policy and on the setting of those rates or is that a separate um, separate paper uh, if material yeah i'm just scrolling down to um looking at page 74 and 75 presumably where we, we do have to set rates at a level where they will recoup expenses so if depreciation is a significant figure and we decide to fully rate for it or partly rate for it, it might impact the size of some of these figures. But at a, low, at a lower level, it will translate to a um, different level of rates, yeah. So, so are they able to be amended during an LTP period? The... I'm not anticipating any changes to the actual finance, the, 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 the size of the piggies, but they were behind all of this is a whole bunch of um, number crunching Excel spreadsheets that spit out numbers. Uh, and some, some of the numbers might change, but not, not to the extent where these pigs will change. Okay, so yeah, what I'm getting at is um, that discussion that may take place around depreciation on on assets and yeah. whether we whether we rate to uh, fund it, um, can any alterations be made through an LTP period, or does that make up part of the LTP? To our revenue and financing policy, I've been looking at uh, I might have to take it on notice, council, and get back to you. I think. Thank you. Um, are we capturing that as an action? I suggest. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But this, um, I'm sorry, before we do, can we just get that captured? Do you want it as an answer? Yes, please. I'll just make sure you've got it. Um, <clears throat> no, 
Nigel. Can I ask you please just to repeat the specific question or request? Yeah, so basically the question is, have we got the ability to make a change on whether we depreciate an asset during an LTP period or, or is it set in policy um, at the start of the LTP process? So that, yeah, that, that's basically my question. Yeah. Staff to investigate whether any alteration to our decisions to depreciate assets can be changed during the LTP period. Thank you. And so can we a mover and a second of the receipt of that paper, please? Thank you, Nigel. And Andy, thank you. And all in favour? Against? Carried. Strategic risk review. Yeah, just continuing um, our review of the strategic risk register, ELT have moved away from looking at them all, all at once, twice a year, to uh, reviewing these on a rotation basis. I think the previous audit and risk committee we bought you risks one, three, four, and 10, mm -hmm. as per page 76. And this review, we're looking at risks five and six. Five and six, yep. Yeah. And not significant changes. Uh, I think the covering report explains why we've tweaked some of the operational, <laughs> some of risk five, to take out some of the uh, cap more capital related comments. Mm -hmm because this is all about financial stability in terms of um, income and expenditure. I was certainly comfortable with the changes suggested. They um, had some clarification, I think, a bit of sharpness, so. Uh, committee, questions, comments? Nigel. Yeah, just a question on page 78 and uh, the second bullet point out to the right, um, where the removal of the wording function that is reported to each finance and performance committee and audit risk committee meeting. So the management report, financial management reporting, um, does that say it's not going to be reported to those committees? Uh, yeah, I just wanted clarification around that, or is that still a process that will be in place? It'll still be reported, uh, but what what we're doing here is saying the key responsibility is with ELT, not with the committees. So ELT are primary responsibility for the uh, ongoing financial management. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Right, can I check whether people are comfortable with those changes and we should receive uh, this report? Do I have a mover and seconded? Did I miss someone? Dave, also. Thanks, Dave. Seconded, Angus. Thank you. All in favour? <coughs> Against? Carried. Sensitive expenditure. <coughs> uh, Dan is online. I don't know if he wants to speak to it, but if not, I can just introduce it. Um, good morning. Well, I can go for it. So it's uh, our sensitive expenditure we present to the Audit and Risk Committee every six months. Uh, essentially, it's just a extract from the general ledger. Uh, we haven't audited it, and it's provided for information purposes, um, really. But I'm happy to take any questions on that one. Thanks, Danny. Danny, appreciate it. Yeah, are there any questions? I 
I would just say, if I may, um, there's, in the far right-hand column is the variance and the red or green. Mm -hmm. Like most councils, we're getting more green at the moment because the travels, the amount of travel with staff are taking is significantly reduced. So, yeah. I think, um, thank you, appreciate that. And I <coughs> appreciate visibility of this expenditure. So thank you, thank you, Danny. Um, just a question from me in terms of the council one, uh, the travel costs and accommodation. Um, so um, attending local government New Zealand uh, conferences, those are captured in that space. Um, yeah, they, they should be. Yeah. Might help that local government conference could well be in, as in Palmerston. <laughs> this year. So. Anything? We should send everybody and send them on a bus. Yeah. Anything further, Dave? Do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. And just um, a, a question for the for the CE: Is there, um, given the fact we uh, are in our current situation with COVID and people um, working remotely from home, uh, has that in any way identified at any additional costs that may be falling upon upon staff in any way? I'm not sure that there would be, but I'm just throwing it out there. Is there some additional costing somewhere that? We may need to be considering a, a, a cost code for. I don't know what it could possibly be, but I'm just saying, are we a, are we aware and abreast that working from home, less travel and these other things, but there may be some other costs being incurred, and are they? Uh, the answer broadly is not material. Um, the kind of costs that are attributed really for working from home is. Uh, IT related, and that's part of our general move towards um, mobile working for, for staff anyway. Um, but other than that, th th it's really rats and mice. Thank you. Anything further? No. Can we please have a mover and seconder for the receipt of this report, please? Thank you, Nigel. Dave, I think that was, I saw your hand move. I did. Thank you. Appreciate it. All in favour? Against? Carried. Accounting policy review. Danny, we're in your hands once more. Anything you wish to comment on? Again, I'll take the um, report as read. Um, basically, the only change to accounting policies that we've made um, for the LTP is to make sure we comply with the accounting standards. Uh, it doesn't have a material impact on council uh, with what we currently have in, in terms of financial assets and financial instruments as a whole. Um, just means we have to change the calculation of our um, um, provision for doubtful debts. Uh, other than that, there's the change is uh, pretty minimal. Thank you. Questions? No. Danny, you're getting off lightly here. Doing well. You need to stop. It's now 11 o'clock. That's what I've been trying. Yes, to sorry, yes, it it's is now 11 o'clock. We need to take a break. We need to take a break. Yes, Thank you. Yes. I understand the rules. We shall, in that case, folks. Do you just want to move and receive this report? We shall. Thank you. All right, we have a mover and seconder just for this report. Thank you. It's Angus and Nigel. All in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. All right, we need to take a break, come back and have a look at uh, Audit New Zealand. Come back at 10 past 11.
much. Thank you. All right. Folks, thank you. Welcome back uh, to Audit and Risk meeting. We will get underway again now. Moving on to um, the Audit New Zealand updates, management letter update. Uh, can I just start with a comment that Dave uh, offered to have, or Chris, I should say, from Audit New Zealand had offered to attend, should we yeah. wish, yeah. at this meeting. Um, he will definitely be there for the next meeting. And it was put to me as to, you know, would we like him to be present? Normally I would say yes, but I don't have any reason for, well, I do. A couple of reasons for saying no. One was the management responses in the management letter are not complete. Um, and I thought it would be better to be hearing Chris's response to the management responses, whether he thinks they're adequate or there's something missing. But also I thought uh, it might be appropriate to give the committee an opportunity without audit in the room if they had any questions or any explanations they wanted to ask of management. So that was my um, reason for not inviting Chris to attend Normally, very happy to have him here. And yeah, there'll be another little wee stage to this as well. So, uh, Chris has interviewed um, you know, Peter and the senior team and myself separately around you know, where we see the organisation being at. My guess is from that, they will come back and they will say um, this will be part of the focus of our future work. So, so you get a fairly early heads up as to what they will be looking at. So, yeah, I agree. It's probably more appropriate that once that it's all completed. Mm. And so, yes, it wasn't. It wasn't trying to keep them out specifically, but also just felt the opportunity. If you had any questions, you didn't want to feel constrained by having audit in the in the room. So, I, I, may I comment, please? Um, I, I just am continue to be delighted with uh, the response we get from Chris Webby and the oh, work um, with him. I would report to the committee, although I'm doing this informally by, by only orally, but um, that, uh, you know, when I had the session with Chris yesterday, I feel that we do have some robust conversations, mm -hmm. um, but we deal with those uh, as we go. And um, he's very proactive in addressing any concerns I have. Uh, and he's also thorough when it comes to his, ex his expectations of how our council can improve our, our, the quality of our reporting to them. Uh, he's been clear. Uh, I've acknowledged it. And Dave's team has, has made vast improvements, particularly under Danny's leadership, in the way this is working. Uh, and I'm, I would report to the committee that I'm comfortable um, in fact, more than comfortable with the relationship with all New Zealand uh, and, and our working relationship. Excellent. Oh, I'm delighted to hear that. Thank you. Mm. I, know, I guess if knowing that, I would, would be less inclined to even contemplate not having them present. Mm. That, 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 that was perhaps my point where I was driving to, Absolutely. is that yeah. um, I have zero uh, concern or, or need to have... Um, uh, uh, um, any thought that would not have them inclusive. Uh, that is our approach as, an, as a staff organisation, um, that we are completely open with them about emerging risks, issues, things that, that do keep us awake at night. And, and I have leveraged uh, conversations with Chris during the last 12 months, which he has given me advice off the record. Excellent. Uh, in the same way that I come to you right. for that very yeah. same thing. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that, that will be our, our default setting, will yep. inclusive. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely concur. Okay, uh, great. Um, it's, a, it's a conversation where you're not scared to bring up uh, subjects of literally what keeps you awake at night. And that, that should be our default setting, that ability to have those conversations and raise any points whatsoever. As it is with this committee, um, Mr Chair. Yep. Well, look, I, I you know, I, I apologise on that basis because I, I wasn't aware of that level of um, quality of relationship. Had I known that, I would have, he would have been on screen. So, thank you. 
can, can I just would, I, would it be okay if I just of course. Uh, if Dave or Danny have any comments to make to to that? Um, I might jump in first, and yeah, so the twenty. 20 stroke 21 management letter which is here which doesn't have the management responses in uh there's there's not a lot there's nothing controversial in there i don't think or sensational um we, we've agreed with all of their recommendations so it's, it, there, there is nothing adversarial um, in their management report can i just yeah. interrupt for a sec because yeah. i think the, if i may peter i think the mm. question peter was asking was whether you concur with that same sentiment well, in I'm terms saying, of the yeah. quality of relationship with audit new zealand and with chris exactly. in particular exactly Sorry. No, 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 that's fine. And Danny? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got no issues of Chris and, and working with him. It's, it's been good working from the other side as well. Mm. Okay, thank you, Danny. Appreciate it. All right, Andy. I just wonder from the committee's point of view um, whether there is any value in Peter and I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we're both on the same page here, highlighting where our concerns are you know obviously the three waters is a very big concern the unknown information uh cost es escalations um you know the ability to do work capex programs there's a whole series of those that that we raise as as concerns in these in these discussions mm. i don't know whether peter would you know how far we go down the track here, but um, that's the sort of conversation that occurs. Oh, I can, may concur with His Worship that um, how collectively we have outlined um, our uh, risks and, and issues. Um, I would presume, however, that that's what Audit New Zealand would report back to us and uh, a, a sort of synthesis of that. Mm. I think, if I may, the, the one thing that I hadn't, I haven't discussed, even even with the mayor, uh, which I, if I could add now, if that, mm. yeah, please. Um, I I spoke um, recently at a regional chief executives forum, uh, and I spoke yesterday with Audit New Zealand on this, and I referred to um, the Colin Powell principle in warfare where um, he had a thing called the 40-70 rule uh, where if you had less than 40% information you are unable to make a battle decision. If you have more than 70% of the information you're too late. You've lost the element of surprise in a battle situation. Uh, council and local government would require of me uh, and the people within the organisation to operate in the high 90s, to have certainty in the decisions we're making. And I'm finding uh, with the workload that m myself and my staff have, that we are dropping down that scale, that the amount of information we have is there, our ability to read it, process it, deal with it before the next thing comes along is reduced. And um, I would call it you know, a, a, an avalanche or tsunami of information and, uh, and take on our time for various reform Zoom calls and et cetera, that I now fear not necessarily for this year, but in 10 or 15 years, that something that I've missed now will have a, an impact on council when I think of something like a CTV building in Christchurch where you know, there is an incident and it comes back to something being missed somewhere. Uh, and that's a, a, a very real risk, I think, that I'm exploring and how do I best do I articulate that uh, and, and mitigate. Yeah. I, I wrote a report over the last few days and I highlighted it. It was around three waters. And I highlighted it that this is the date that I am writing this report. And I'm stressing that this is the date because in one week's time, if you're reading this, it may not be relevant to the current situation. And that's exactly where we're at. Yeah. And, uh, and to back up your point is that that volume of information is not going to reduce either. We know that it's going to go in the opposite direction. Mm. 
um, quickly. So it's a challenge. So all, all I can do in terms of mitigation is continue to plead to the committee that I'll remain vigilant to, to risks um, and, and be as diligent as you'd anticipate I would be. Um, it's, uh, I, it's, a, it's a challenge that is not unique to me or to my staff. No, um, not um, the slightest. But it would be interesting, particularly from your point of view, as mm. you talk to other chairs, mm. how are other councils managing the, the, the information? And I know elected members have a lot of information to go through mm. as well. So um, is, that, is that a tier one risk? Mm. Mm. I don't know. Leave it with me to contemplate, and, and I will have that conversation. That will be interesting. Mm. Angus is quite scary. Thank you. Angus. So my query um, to Peter, based on his comment, what extra tools would, um, you know, I'm assuming you're going to ask for extra tools from council so that we don't have that, um, that risk 10 years down the track. That we we just didn't see because we were overwhelmed with stuff coming at us. Um, are, are there some are there some low hanging fruit? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, th th thank you for, for the question. I, I haven't uh, included. Sorry, what what council are considering as part of the annual plan? are um, additional resources for the organisation. And what I find, um, the, my mitigation measures in that regard, you will see in your deliberations for the resources and personnel our annual plan is requesting. And how that manifests itself is that if I have my staff delivering on all the things that they say they will do, whether that's in our annual plan or our statement of service performance, or um, et cetera, then I get much fewer uh, complaints or, or, or questions or issues raised to me, which therefore frees me up to be making really good decisions um, with the information that I have, even though there's a lot of information. And I'd rather um, deal with, the, with this via releasing me from the complaint type thing which is where our high performance, where our um, added resources that, are, that um, you'll see and talk about this afternoon is, is aimed at, 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 uh, at improving our, our capability in that area, or those areas, sorry. Thank you for your question. Mm. Thank you, Angus. All right, folks, with that context in mind, let's move back to the... Dave, you were starting to talk about the management letter, 2021. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I don't know if Danny wanted to um, introduce this or I can talk about the very briefly. The 1920 management letter report has already been presented to this committee. Um, it's now got, it's now been finalised. It was brought it back just to um, close that. And the 2021 report, I don't think you have seen before. Uh, it's attached. There's only four recommendations that audit, audit make. Uh, from memory, they're on page 128, 131, 132, and 133. Uh, we've agreed with all of their recommendations that we'll be taking them forward and working, working them through. Uh, and there's nothing particularly major in there. Danny, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, not, not, not really. There's, I mean, the, you can see the number of issues close uh, to the still open, reduce each year, and we continue to um, do that. I think some of the ones that are still in there, um, and the next report will reduce again. And that was noted, Danny. Thank you. We, we can see the number of closed items uh, moving through. It's very good. So, can I? pass over to the committee, ask the committee for any questions, and in particular around those, that, that management letter on the pages identified by Dave. Nigel. I hate to say this, Nigel, but you are on mute. 
We should have a fine jar. <laughs> well, let's so give them quite well. Do we, do we have a fine jar? Mm -hmm. We should, yes. <laughs> there, there will be a fine jar from here on in. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, Excellent. Might as well pay now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll pay up. Sorry, oh, Nigel, tab. carry on. On my tab, would you, officer? Um, right, page 137 of the, uh, of the order paper. There's in the recommendations, and it gives a status of previous recommendations. There's just a couple there that are outstanding with no progress on them. I just wondered if there's any comment from staff in regards with those. Uh, I can answer um, just having a look um, now and the ones that say um, outstanding. Um, the the one that I can see in front of me changes to financial delegation. Um, that one we are, every, every time a change is made in the system, it, it comes to me for review. So although not quarterly, it, it's a lot more frequent um, than that. And um, and I think the other one, the other outstanding one, the infrastructure assets, we're always collecting more data. Um, we, we're due for a revaluation this year, which again will improve the quality of the data for our infrastructure assets. So basically that, those actions will um, will recognize and deal with those outstanding matters. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the one on the next page, improving credit the master file review process. Um, we, we've changed our process up um, to make sure we're getting bank deposit slips or, or screenshots of internet banking to confirm it. Um, we're not phoning each individual new creditor to confirm those. However, we think that the controls that we do have in place are now mitigating those risks, making sure that the, the bank account that's being paid to actually matches the name of the creditor. Um, that's good. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Other questions? Andy, anything? Yeah, I'm glad, Danny, you made comment about the revaluation because that's in this coming year, isn't it? And um, this is an issue that I raised um, with audit. Um, what I think will happen over the next few years is as we've significantly lowered the RMM um, on our roading network, you know, we're the reseal program has been substantially cut back, largely because of Waka Katahi's position, I suspect. But um, the revaluation of the roading network will be something that will be interested to me, um, of interest to me. Can I, uh, yes. Just at the right time, uh, I had a discussion yesterday with audit about the revaluation that's happening this year. Mm. And they raised as a flag to me a risk for all councils in the country at the moment is the price of construction has risen by so much that it's unrealistic to expect that it will stay that high and we know it will come down again at some point, but we don't know when that is. So what, uh, what Chris said to me is we, they will pay special attention to whoever is going to do the revaluation as to what the limitations are on the numbers that we put in the revaluation. So we're going to have to reevaluate it at today's cost of construction, knowing that within a year or two years, it'll come back down again. So from an audit perspective, that's quite a tricky thing to get past, to say we have numbers in there that we don't really have confidence in and how are we going to deal with it. So that's just a, a, a bit of a risk for us on the, on, the, um, on the audit coming up. Absolutely, understand that. Thank you. All right. Any other questions at all? No, thank you. They do look reasonably straightforward as Dave had mentioned. And I think, and if I can reflect back, this, um, this, this looks cleaner and cleaner every year and um, clearer, um, which is great work. Um, and Danny, your <coughs> contribution has not gone unnoticed um, we really appreciate it and appreciate your contribution at our, our meetings here as well, realising it's only a small part of your job. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. All right, can we please have a mover and seconder? Yep, order. Thank you. And Nigel, seconding, thank you. All in favour? 
against carried. Thank you. Uh, Audit and Risk Committee Work Programme. Yeah, just presented as a standing item to see if committee members wanted to add or delete anything out of the um, standard work program. Committee members, questions? I'm happy with what's there. I think it's a good comprehensive list. Um, we we recognise that there's always that opportunity to dump more work. No, I, just, I take that back. <laughs> Goes without saying, Chair. <laughs> Not at all. I would, I would apologise if that was the case. We, well, we've already had a discussion in this meeting today about, um, for instance, the wastewater project um, and identifying those projects that are of um, high value. So I think we've, we've sort of done that. Yep, we have. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and, and in the context, though, I also, you know, we need to take on board the points Peter's made around sheer volume of work and information. We have to be careful about the uh, our, anything we're imposing on staff. So thank you, Dave. Again, thank you for the work in this area. And can I have a mover and seconder for Audit and Risk Committee Work Programme? Unaltered. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Angus. All in favour? Thank you. Against? Carried. All right, moving to public excluded. Now, we need a 